Good morning and welcome to our service this morning. We begin our time together with a quote from 1 Corinthians 15. Paul to the Corinthian churches said, Let me now remind you of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then and you still stand firm in it. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Let's say together this prayer of thankfulness. We give you our thanks, Lord of heaven and earth, for the many gifts of your love that you give us each day. Dear God, I'm sorry for ignoring you and living my own way. Thank you for your free gift of forgiveness and eternal life. Thank you that although I am guilty, Jesus took my punishment so that I can be declared innocent. Please help me to love, trust and obey you each day. Amen. We can be sure of his forgiveness and love. From Isaiah 26 we read, But those who die in the Lord will live. Their bodies will rise again. Those who sleep in the earth will rise up and sing for joy. For your life-giving light will fall like dew on our people in the place of the dead.
announcements for today. Men's Bible study is meeting online this afternoon, 2.30 till 3.30. Uh, we'll be using Zoom and the access code and password are the same as for this service. So just the same way that you click on for this, um, you can uh, join the Men's Bible Study at 2.30 till 3.30 this afternoon. There's no kids' church groups um, this Sunday or next Sunday because of the school holidays, but we do have our kids' talk and kids' song, so please do stay for that. A uh, big thank you to those who have been uh, financially supporting the church during this difficult time. Ministries of the church have been continuing uh, online for some time and as we slowly move out of uh, the stay-at-home orders, uh, things will be starting up in person. Uh, so a big thank you to, to those who have continued to financially support the church through this difficult time. I think that next Sunday is the beginning of Daylight Saving, so join a little bit earlier than usual, one hour. Um, so I think I have that date right, the first Sunday in October. Uh, so Daylight Saving, whatever you think of it, it's a reality, so just join. Uh, those are all of the announcements for today. But item number six, and our first Bible reading is from Luke 16, 22 to 26. Jesus told a parable of a rich man and a poor man named Lazarus, and we take the story from verse 22. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried. And he went to the place of the dead. There, in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with, with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Liz Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime... You had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted, and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over from you to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Here ends the reading. May God bless us through the reading of his word. At item number seven, we're going to be praying for Nicole Linklater, who has served as part of a missionary team in Chad in Africa. Uh, Nicole is coming back to Australia before moving on to another ministry. Uh, so let us uh, support Nicole and also the leaders of the Chad churches um, during this transition time. At item number seven, our Heavenly Father, we cannot understand the many sad and bad things that happen in your world. We thank you, Lord, that you know and love us. Thank you that we can always ask you for help and guidance. Lord God, we pray for Nicole Linklater, who has served for many years in Chad, Africa. We thank you for the growth in the Chad Church through the ministry of Nicole and the missionary teams. Lord God, as Nicole leaves Chad, we pray that the local church leaders will continue to teach and guide the churches and encourage them to reach out with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our second Bible reading is from 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 21. Paul, writing to the Corinthian churches, says... The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God, in his wisdom, 
saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. Here ends the reading. May God bless us through the reading of his word. We have our children's talk. Our children's talk today is Bob the Bird. One day, Bob the Bird went to visit his friends. First, he flew to the farm to see Kevin the quail. Come and see the farmer, said Kevin. You won't believe it. He has sown his crop, but every day he worries. What if it doesn't rain? What if, what if the plants don't grow? What if I don't have enough food for my family? Poor fellow, doesn't he have a father in heaven like the one who cares for birds? Bob said goodbye to Kevin and flew to town to see Penelope the pigeon. Come and see the butcher, said Penelope. You won't believe it. He says his sausages are all beef, but I've seen him fill them. They are half sawdust. Every day he worries. If I don't cut corners, I will go broke. If I go broke, I will lose my shop. If I lose my shop, I will lose my reputation as a respectable businessman. Poor fellow, doesn't he have a father in heaven like the one who cares for birds? It was getting late, so... Bob said goodbye to Penelope and flew off to visit his old friend Ozzy the Owl. Come and look at this, said Ozzy. You won't believe it. She does an honest day's work, then stays up every night worrying. What if prices goes up? What if my wages goes down? What if I fall asleep and someone steals my money? Doesn't she have a father in heaven like the one who cares for birds? The next day, Bob saw a crowd of worried people. He felt sad because they didn't seem to have a father in heaven who cared for them. But in the middle of the crowd was one man who looked happy. Don't worry about your life, he said. Don't worry about having something to eat or wear. Life is more than food and clothes. Look at the birds in the sky. They don't plant or harvest. They don't even store grain in barns. Yet your Father in heaven feeds them. Hooray! The people do have a Father in heaven who cares for them. If only they would believe it. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for leading us and showing us how to live as your children. Thank you that you are always kind and good Father in heaven who cares for us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Truth and the
the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. John 14, 6. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, to the Father except through me. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Item number 12 in our order of service, a quote from Isaiah 45. For the Lord is God, and he created the heavens and the earth and put everything in place. He made the world to be lived in, not to be a place of empty chaos. I am the Lord, he says, and there is no other. I publicly proclaim bold promises. 
I do not whisper obscurities in some dark corner. I would not have told the people to seek me if I could not be found. I, the Lord, speak only what is true and declare only what is right. We're continuing our series in evangelism. Today our topic is, Is Your God Stopping You From Talking About Jesus? And the passage we're looking at is Matthew thirteen thirty six to 43. Jesus has told a parable of a field that has both weeds and valuable wheat in it. Take up the story from verse 36. Then leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house. His disciples said, please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. Jesus replied, The Son of Man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the harvesters are the angels." Just as the weeds are sorted out and burnt in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. Anyone who with ears to hear should listen and understand. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit guided the human authors of the Bible so that what they recorded are not their thoughts about you, but is your message directly to us. And as we listen to uh, this passage that talks about the reality of uh, your kingdom, and uh, the message from your Son. We pray that you would speak to us and give us understanding, that you would challenge us and encourage us. And we ask this through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Is your God stopping you from talking about Jesus? Uh, The evangelist Rico Tice wrote, We all have moments in life that we wish we could rewind and do things very differently. For me, the thing I most regret is what happened before my grandmother's death, or rather, what didn't happen. My grandmother died absolutely convinced that God would accept her because she was a good person. She had no faith in Christ. My brother and I were the only Christians in the family, and my brother broke down in tears when he did the Bible reading at her funeral. And I was the only one who knew why. She had died without Christ. And here's what I regret. In the week before her death, I did not speak to her about Jesus. I loved her, but I didn't say anything to her. When my other grandmother had died, I'd taken her hand and prayed with her, but not that grandmother. I just let her go. Why didn't I tell her about Christ? I've come to realize that I was afraid of what she'd say, and I was afraid of what my family would say, because I knew that they would think it was inappropriate and unhelpful. I was afraid. I loved my grandmother, and she loved me, but the hard truth is that I loved myself more than her. I wanted my family to think well of me more than I wanted her to think of Christ as her saviour. That's why I didn't speak to her. I loved myself more than I loved her and, and more than I loved my Lord. And that means that my family's respect and having an easy time in life had become idols to me. There has to be something in our hearts that we make the most important thing in life. We sacrifice other things in life to have it or to keep it. 
And if that something isn't God, then it's an idol. And idols can be good things that God gave us to enjoy. The problem comes when we elevate them to divine status, when we love them more and think we need them more than we love and need God. And when it came down to it, the hard truth was that I wanted my family to respect me more than I wanted to bring glory to Jesus or see my grandmother saved. It was my idol, a good thing elevated to a divine thing. I was so afraid of losing it that I kept my mouth shut. Do we understand Rico's point? The Bible is clear that everyone worships something. Paul tells the Roman churches, they traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Rico said, money, reputation, power, career, family and so on. These are all good things that we can turn into God things and our hearts get kidnapped. At the heart of all sin is idolatry in the heart, loving and obeying something other than our creator, God. Rico admitted that I'm constantly struggling to keep the Lord Jesus at the center of my heart to find my identity and assurance and purpose and satisfaction in him. And unless I do, I will not speak about him. After all, we talk about what we love. So for as long as Jesus is not my greatest love, I will keep quiet about him in order to serve my greatest love, my idol. I will keep quiet about him because I'm afraid of losing my greatest love, my idol. The reason that we won't talk about Jesus, even if we have right knowledge about God clear in our heads, is because of what is going on in our hearts. That's why we might say enough to salve our consciences. We talk about church or Jesus' love or how helpful it is to pray but we won't say enough to help people be saved. We won't talk about death or sin or hell or salvation. When the Apostle Paul was in Athens, he was greatly distressed when he saw everyone worshipping false gods. The glory and praise that rightly belongs to the creator of the world was being given instead to things the Lord had created. So when Paul had the opportunity to speak to the city leaders, he introduced them to the real and living God. He said, He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples, and human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything. See, Paul is not adding one more God to their long list of options for worship. He is clear that they have gone the wrong way. They have totally failed to understand the truth of the one and only creator, God. And we also need to be clear when we speak about our Lord Jesus. We should never be ashamed to tell someone that what they believe is not right. The Old Testament prophets, the early church leaders, and our Lord Jesus did it all the time. Jesus shared a meal with tax collectors, but the Pharisees and their teachers of the religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples, Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Well, Jesus answered them, Healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Jesus confronted and corrected the religious leaders of his day. 
They should have been helping sinners to repent and come back to God. But with smug superiority, they criticised and condemned fellow sinners. They pointed to the sins of others, but were blind to their own more serious faults. (coughs) In God's eyes, they had completely failed to teach and live the truth of God's word. And Jesus did not hesitate to confront them with the painful truth. (coughs) Oh, excuse me. And Jesus did not hesitate to confront them with the painful truth that they were wrong and they were in serious trouble with God. (coughs) Jesus is either the real God who deserves our trust and obedience, or he is a false God who should be rejected. But Jesus Christ should never be portrayed as just one possible option for a person's worship and obedience. The truth of Jesus is not decided by whether people like the gospel message or not. Human desire does not determine truth. As Paul taught the Corinthian believers, The message of the cross is foolish to those headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. And Paul was very clear when he preached the gospel message to the Athenian city leaders. They may have big and impressive and expensive temples to their gods, but they are on the wrong path. So Paul calls them to stop to move over to the true path while they still have the chance to change. Paul told them, He, God, commands everyone, everywhere, to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. Paul was not ashamed to tell them about the coming judgment and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, even though both God's judgment and the idea of a bodily resurrection were considered to be foolish ideas to the Greek philosophers. When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt, but others said, we want to hear more about this later. And some joined him and became believers. To reach those who came to believe in Christ, he had to put up with the contempt of others. And so do we. Why should we tell people about Jesus Christ? The first and most important reason is because God alone is worthy of all worship, praise and honour. To give the Lord's worship to a weak and false counterfeit God is to insult the one true creator and judge of the world. Secondly, we tell people the gospel of Jesus because he has a wonderful eternity for those who will love, trust and obey him now. When one of Jesus' closest friends died, Jesus went and spoke to the friend's sister Martha. Jesus told her, Your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said. He will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. Do we believe Jesus? Are we excited about the prospect of spending eternity with Jesus and his Father, God? If we are, then we will want others to share in this wonderful future as well. So we'll tell them about Jesus. We'll tell them the truth about death, sin, judgment and hell. Why do we tell people the good news of Jesus Christ? Because God's judgment and hell are real. And the cross of Christ tells us that God does not want us to face his justice. He wants us to receive grace, mercy and the gift of eternal life. 
As Peter wrote, he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. God's justice, without the atoning cross of Jesus, should rightly terrify us. Jesus was clear on the reality and the horrors of hell. It is not a popular truth, but it is the truth. When John prepared the way for Jesus, he told the crowds, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. And Jesus told a parable about a field that contains both valuable wheat and worthless weeds. He said, Just as the weeds are sorted out and burnt in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels. They will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace. We should never think that sin is not really a serious problem. God judges sin fairly, and that is frightening. But Jesus said, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It is better to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the maggots never die and the fire never goes out. When God brings people to final judgment, their fate is fixed and unchangeable. The time for repentance and forgiveness has passed. Rico Tice wrote, In the 21st century, many people either dismiss hell as a myth or treat it as a joke. They joke that they'd rather be in hell than heaven because all their friends will be in hell too and it'll be so much more fun. But Jesus did not view hell like that. He once told a harrowing story about a rich man who died and there in torment he saw Abraham in the far distance. We need to hear Jesus telling us that hell is real and let's be clear to say that there is no hell is to call Jesus a liar. And Jesus tells us that hell is a place of suffering. There's no fun in hell. Hell means being totally separated from God's mercy and blessing. Everything good that we enjoy now is a gift from God. In hell there are no gifts. That's God's punishment on those who choose eternity without him. The worst you have experienced in this life is only a glimmer of what it is like. As the rich man in Jesus' parable describes it, it is torment. The rich man asks for some relief from the agony, but he is told, and this is harrowing and heartbreaking, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can can cross over from you to here, and no one can cross over from us to there. Hell, as Jesus describes it, is final and fixed. There are no more chances. God gives people this life to make their decision, and he treats us as adults and gives us what we've chosen, life with him or life without him. So don't be deluded. Everyone needs Jesus. Everyone. We may be flourishing now, but death is real. Death does not always warn us of its arrival. And without Jesus, what lies beyond is terrible. And so everyone needs to hear about him. So this is why we talk about Jesus, even though it is tough. This is why it is always worth it. Hell is a terrible reality. We desperately want people to avoid. 
The new creation is a wonderful place. We urgently want people to enjoy. And the Lord Jesus deserves all glory. That is what makes us willing to take the risk of crossing the pain line. Rico continued, So if I could turn back time to my grandmother's deathbed, I would pray before I go to see her. Lord, you know I've often found my identity in family approval. Please forgive me. Thank you that my true identity is in Christ. Thank you that in him I have your approval as my heavenly father. So please help me to be unafraid of my family's rejection as I seek to speak to my grandmother. Please give me the kindness and gentleness of Jesus, and yet give me the boldness to ask to pray with her about the Lord Jesus who is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. If we are to share Christ, we need first to love Christ. We need to ask the Spirit to go to work in our hearts with the gospel so that we'll love Christ more and more and he'll push out our idols. So when we talk about what we love, we'll be talking about Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you continue to challenge us to make you first and foremost in our life. We love many good things that you give us in this life, like our family and our friends, and yet, Heavenly Father, they should never take your place. Father, the most loving thing that we can do for those who do not yet know you is to talk to them about you and your Son, our Lord Jesus. We pray that you will give us the boldness and the gentleness that are both required in order to speak well and wisely the truth of the gospel and to be prepared to pay the price of being rejected if that is what occurs. We pray, Heavenly Father, you continue to guide us in your ways and we ask these things through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.